is born. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to, to be able to approach the throne of God in our prayer time, Lord. And we just thank you for that chance that we get to do this. And, and Lord, we ask right now, Father God, that your spirit would once again fall fresh on us, Lord Jesus. And, and Father, I think about all these people at the altar, Father, I'm praying, and probably a lot of them are praying for Tyler and Megan this morning, Lord. And, and Father, they need your touch from you, Jesus. Father, I know everything looks good, but Father, we just never know. Um, I know that Tyler's struggling with, with, with uh, the idea that he wasn't there when the baby was born. And, and, and Father, I just pray that you just really bless this family. Be with Jackson. Be with this little one, Father God. Three pounds, 11 ounces, and 16 inches long. Father, I pray that your hand of mercy and grace will be on him. And along with Tyler and Megan too, Father God, as they, as they um, figure things out, Lord, and <laughs> figure things out. And, and Lord, this is a young couple, Lord Jesus, and they've not established themselves financially very real, real well. And, and Father, so they continue to work and, and, and go through things. And, but Lord, they need your help this morning. They need your touch. So Lord, this morning I pray for them. And I pray for all the other requests in the church, Father. I think about Gary Gillette. He's getting, coming home from the hospital today, Father. So I pray for him, Lord. That I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that all went well with his surgery. And thank you for watching over that family, Lord Jesus, as this, through this time. And, and also for, for, for our Brother Joe as he's in the hospital, with his Father, and, and struggling with some things, Lord. I pray for him that you would just really work in his life, Father God, and touch him, Jesus. Lord, um, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we are sure glad we know who holds tomorrow. And, and Father, we don't know where we would be without your grace, without your mercy, and without your love. So, Father, this morning I pray for all these requests. And, Father, I also pray for, for Clay and Trey, Father God, as they begin this new, this new journey. Father, being dedicated to the Lord, may you bless the, these, these young people, Father, these children. May you watch over their steps, Lord, every single day. We love you, Father, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Children's Church, you are dismissed. If you're bigger than this, you have to stay in here with me. Get out of here. Kids are dismissed. That too, that doesn't mean, well, she's leaving too, look. Not fair. I want to do the Advent reading this morning. We're going to light our second candle this morning. And um, today it's about hope. It's about hope. Aren't you glad that we have hope in Christ? Today we're going to relight the, the, the peace candle that we lit last week. We'll relight that candle. <clears throat> and now we light the candle for the second candle of Advent. This is the candle of hope. The hope of all, of the, of all that we have. I'm glad to have hope. So, so um, with Christians around the world, we use this light to help pr us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. So we're going to light this candle for the candle of hope. And let's pray this morning. Father, we're grateful for the hope that we have in Christ. Baby born in a manger. Again, Father, we just are so thankful that we know, that we know, that we know. That our hope doesn't lie in any place else but in Christ alone. So bless us this holiday season, Father God. May we have hope and peace in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The Advent season. I told you before I love Christmas. This morning we're going to talk about the hope of Christmas. As soon as I get my little clicker here, we'll be able to do that. The hope of Christmas. A family was on their way to the hospital with a 15-year-old daughter who was scheduled to undergo, undergo a tonsillectomy. 
During the ride, they talked about how the procedure would be performed. Dad, the teenager, asked, how are they going to keep my mouth open for surgery? And without hesitation, the dad quipped, they're going to put a cell phone by your mouth. It's pretty good, right? The Israelite nation looked forward to the coming of the Messiah with hope. Luke described this hope in his record of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. But we had hope that he, Jesus, was the one who was going to come to redeem us. This messianic hope is, the, is, is, is further included by John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, when he was filled with the Spirit and prophesied in, in Luke in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 74. If you've got your Bibles, flip open to that. Luke chapter 1, 67 through 74. And it says this. If you've got it on your phone, too, that's fine, too. If you, you, you can use your phone and your, your tablets in here, too. It's great. We don't mind. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of the servant David. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. The definition of hope, a wish or desire accompanied by, uh, by a confident expectation of its fulfillment. Something that is hoped for or desired, success is our hope. Today we're going to look at five hopes of Christmas and see how each hope for us, each hope is for us, this Christmas. Hope, hope number one is a hope of a redeemed, a redeemer. The hope of a redeemer. Praise be to the Lord, it says in verse 68, the God of Israel, because he has come to redeem his people. What does it mean to be redeemed? What do you do when you, what, what do you do when you go to the store and you redeem something? You get what? You redeem a coupon, so you get you get money off and all that stuff like that. Do you know that my Redeemer lives? That my Redeemer lives? That's not a joke, guys. He's alive. He's well. He's active and he's moving. My Redeemer is not one who, who I mourn. I don't mourn my Redeemer. I celebrate him, amen? I celebrate my Redeemer because you know what? My Redeemer isn't dead. My Redeemer lives. The patriarch Job said this, I know that my, Job, even Job pr pr prophesied this, I know that my Redeemer lives and, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. To those who are, who are sold in sin, it is our eternal hope that we will be redeemed from this world of sin and taken to heaven. In the Old Testament, especially in the book of Ruth, the kinsman Redeemer was closely related who purchased his relative out of slavery. He redeems us, doesn't he? He purchases us. He purchases us with his blood and with the sacrifice that he made on the cross for each one of us. He's our redeemer. How about complete redemption? Jesus is a thorough redeemer. He redeems us from our past sins, right? Aren't you glad about that? He redeems us from our past sins. And we carry that no more. We lay that down on an altar of prayer. We say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I messed up. Forgive me. I confess my, with my mouth that you're your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are redeemed from our past. Then he also regains us in our present. He brings us back in our present. You know, do you know that even our present is redeemed? This time that we're living in right now? Our present time is redeemed. Because we serve a risen Savior, a Redeemer. So even our present time is redeemed. And aren't you glad to know that even in our future, He's still there. 
He's still there redeeming us. Because, you know, the thing, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. We are not a perfect people. I was, I was traveling with Chad Meacham on, on Friday. We went down to see Tyler and Megan. And I was talking to Chad, and he goes, I'm going to shock you here. He goes, I'm not perfect. I'm like, what? Say it isn't so, Chad. You're not perfect? Well, all this time I thought, I was just kidding, obviously. I know he's not perfect. None of us are, are we? So we're even going to have to have a redeemer for our future, aren't we? Even our future will, will need a redeemer. And guess what? He will be there in the midst of our fallen nature. He'll be there in the, in, 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 to, to redeem us. And also by the rapture as he takes us to heaven. Whew, what a day that will be. When my Jesus I will see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. One day, right? One day. Thank God our Redeemer has come. Thank God our Redeemer lives. Thank God our Redeemer is real. Right? Because people deserve a lot of fake redeemers. A lot of, a lot, a lot of people, they put, their, they put their hope and their trust in. You know, I put, I, I put my hope in my bank account. I put my hope in, 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 in my stocks and bonds. I put my hope in all this other stuff. And all that stuff is earthly stuff. And all that other stuff can fail. And all that other stuff can fall away, can it? In a blink of an eye. It takes one bad decision for somebody and the stock market is going to go, Right? But nobody can take away your Redeemer. Because my Redeemer lives. And my Redeemer is real. Praise God. Uh, how about this? Hope 2. The horn of salvation. The horn of salvation. He has the power to save. He is the only one who has the power to save. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. The second hope of Christmas we're, ex we're expressed by Zechariah as the horn of salvation. The word horn symbolizes strength. The word horn symbolizes strength. The animals, right? The bulls have horns. And what does that symbolize? You know, and the bigger the horn, the bigger the bull. You know, all that, you know, the stronger the bull. Strength. <clears throat> like the horn of an animal. Referring to Jesus as the house of David. It emphasizes that he has the power to save. Unlike redemption, which is the legal action of buying something back, salvation is the experiential and ontological action of transformation. In other words, salvation is us, we were here, and now we're over here. We're no longer living this life, we're living this one. It's kind of what happened to you guys. You're living over here in this life and you're, 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 you're in deep indulged into this life of sin and death. And Jesus comes in and he rescues you and pulls you out of the miry clay and puts you on the rock. The rock of salvation. The rock of Jesus. The strength and the power of who he is. Praise his name this morning. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, aren't you? Woo! He's the only one that has the power to save. Only Jesus, oh, only Jesus has that power. Muhammad doesn't have it. Buddha doesn't have it. None of these guys have it. So all these other people that people worship, symbols anyways, our Redeemer lives. My Redeemer is real. My salvation was bought with a price. Which, only, which means he only has the power to save. It's not a legal code being good enough or even being sacrificial that saves a person. They, that must be born again. We must be spiritually transformed. We have to be spiritually transformed from death to life. Right? Last week, Sheila wasn't here last week and... and um, I so wish I could have been with them at church. Because my great niece, who is 15? Or is she 13? How old is, is huh? 13. Um, 
she she gave her life to Christ not last, I think it was last this summer she gave her life to Christ um, family's not really strong in the or they are now they're, they're coming to church now and all this good stuff and and uh, Lalina that's her name Lalina she walked the aisle and was baptized and she was baptized from death to life from death to life. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer's real. I love that. Because you get to see the transformation in, in this little girl's life from being all this and all this other stuff and now her only desire is to follow Jesus. She found her hope, right? She found her hope. Her hope at Christmas time, she found it. Praise God for that. So I'm so excited for her. I really am. Because she's such a neat girl. She's such a neat young lady. And if, if she would really just totally sell out and, and give 100% to God, she would be amazing. And she's one of, those, one of those young ladies that love kids, you know? And so the kids are just attracted to her, and she just loves them. And, and uh, so she's a special girl. She's a special young lady. Our spirit must be re regenerated, quickened together with Christ and made alive. And only the resurrection power of Jesus can do that. Only the resurrection power. Thank God he sent us a Savior. Amen. As well as a Redeemer who bought us back. He redeemed us. We have a Savior and we have a Redeemer. Praise it. And you know what? The, thing, the cool thing about it is they're all the same person. They're all the same person. It's in the person of Jesus. The true reason for the season, if you didn't know, has nothing to do with the presence under the tree. Although that's symbolized, it's, it's, it's symboled as the three, those three, three wise men bring gifts to Jesus. I wish we could only, bring, I wish we could only buy three gifts. <laughs> huh? I couldn't choose three? Not for my babies, I couldn't. Anyways. Thank God he sent us a Savior and a Redeemer. Where would we be? Where would we be without him? Here's a great hope. He rescued us from our enemies. He rescued us from our enemies. Did you know? Maybe you didn't know this. But there's somebody out there that doesn't like you. Yeah. There's somebody out there that doesn't like you being a Christian. You know what he does? He, he, he scathes around the world looking for people that he can destroy. He slithers like a snake around the world looking for people he can destroy. I'm glad to know that I'm not one of them. Amen. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know where my feet are planted. I know who I am in Christ. I don't have to worry about it. He can, he can slither around all he wants. But I'm prayed up, I'm read up, and I'm fed up. I'm a follower of Jesus. There's hope for our rescue from our enemies. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, just in verse 71. And all those who hate us, the demons, the principalities of darkness, and all these different things that, that like to come against us, like to come against us, you know, you know what? Put on the full body, full armor of Christ. And those things just bounce off. They just bounce off. They can't penetrate because I know who my Savior is and my Redeemer. We need to identify our enemy. When John 10.10 10 says this, we have an adversary, the devil, who goes about as roaring lions seeking whom he may just devour. The thief comes but for, for a kill, to steal and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have a life abundantly. The devil is a thief, and Jesus refers to him as somebody who wants to kill our aspirations to draw near to God. 
steal us from God's presence and destroy us, from, destroy us in hell forever. You know, he has a the devil has a plan for your life too. Did you know that? If you didn't know that, listen. He also has a plan for your life to destroy it, to kill you, and to destroy your life. And you know what? He's really, really good at it too. He's really, really good at it too. Remember where your hope lies, who your hope lies in. And I think a lot of times we forget that stuff. We forget who we serve, who, ser who helps us fight our battles. We forget to lay them down. And at the end of our battle, we're like, man, where was Jesus? You didn't let him in? Let him fight your battles for you. Allow him to be your strength. The hope of Christmas rescues us. Martin Luther says this, and this is from his reformer, recorded in his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. You ready? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark. What is a bulwark? I probably should have looked that up before I... Somebody get that on Google real quick. Come on. Bulwark. You got that, Nathan? Come on, Nathan, you get that up. Bulwark. I'll spell it for you if you want me to. Never failing our helper... He amid the floods of mortal ills prevailed. For still our ancient foe doth seek us, seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide in our striving would be, would be losing? Were, were not the right man of our side, the man of God owns choosing? Thus, thus ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath, his name, from age to age the same, he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten us to, or threaten to undo us, we, listen to this guys, we will fear not for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. O oh, little word shall fell him. A little word, one little word shall fell him. You know what that word is? Jesus. Jesus, that one word, that one name, has the power to fell demons, to fell Satan. Jesus. Yeah, that word is Jesus. The hope of Christmas. Who rescues us from our enemies. How about this one? Mercy. Whew. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. To slow mercies to our ancestors and to re remember his holy covenant, as in verse 72. In a world of people that frequently go before judges and demand justice, I heard a story about a man who was taken before the judge, and the judge said, I suppose you come here to demand, ju to, 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 here to demand justice. The man answered, No, judge. I come before you this morning to ask for mercy. To ask for mercy. What I deserve for my crimes is justice. What I'm pleading for this morning is mercy. Our hope. Not getting what we deserve. Amen? Not getting what we deserve. Because we deserve death, don't we? the way we live our lives and that kind of stuff like that. Psalms 103, 8, and then 10 and 12 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sin deserves. <laughs> he does not treat us as our sin deserves us to be treated. Right? He doesn't treat us the way our sin deserves for us to be treated. He provides mercy. Or he doesn't repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, if you didn't get that, you didn't hear that, you didn't understand that, read it. Because this is awesome stuff. Lord is gracious, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. He does not treat our sins 
as we deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. <clears throat> the third hope of Christmas brings us, br brings, is not confirmation of the justice and judgment that comes through the law of Moses, but the mercy and grace that comes through the babe of Bethlehem, Jesus Christ. Thank God for his mercy at this Christmas time, right? Thank God for his mercy at Christmas time. Thank God for his mercy. Our fifth hope, I love it. Power to serve him without fear. Our power to serve him without fear. And to enable us, and verse 74b says this, and to enable us to serve him without fear. The power to live for God. Our, he provides us with the power that we might live for him, amen? He gives us the power to do that. I love the saying, he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. He gives us the ability to do the jobs that he calls us to do and to do the things he calls us to do. He provides us with that ability and that power that we need. Back in 1983, late, or late early 82, 83. Actually, it was 83 because in 1983 I got saved. 82 in November. 82? You sure? Were you there? I think it was 83. But anyways, we'll have to look at my old, 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 old Bible. I don't think you're right. Anyways. Anyways. I don't think she's right. You know what? I've, I've built that doghouse real nice. I put some, I've put a refrigerator in there and it's heated now. So, so when I'm out there, I don't have a problem anymore. I even heated it. It's really, it's really nice. Decorated it. Got, no, no, no frillies, though. Just the man stuff. <laughs> Anyways. No, I didn't really do that. I don't have a dog house. I never had a dog. Anyways, it gives us power to live for God. And back in that day, you know, I got saved. I was going to the youth group. And all of a sudden, the youth, the youth director left. Paul left. And there stood Sheila and I and a couple of other couples going... What do we do now? So all of a sudden, we take over the youth ministry. I had just gotten saved. I had no idea what I was even doing. The pastor calls us in and goes, You're it. You guys can do this. I'm like, oh, You think? I don't think so. Well, here we are today. Because he equips those that he calls. He doesn't call those that are already equipped. Maybe he does sometimes. Because he pre-equipped them, right? So they're already equipped. He gives us the power to live for God. The fifth hope of Christmas is a double blessing. First, Zechariah is grateful for the power to be able to serve God. This is not a small blessing. We're all acquainted with the war of the rages between flesh and spirit. That is, if we were not the, for the intervention of the Holy Spirit, we could not live for Christ. The Apostle Paul said, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life, Set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, listen to you guys, for what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by sinful nature, God did by sending his son in the likeness of a sinful man to be a sin offering. That's in Romans 8, 2, and 3. God spoke to Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the old heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. It's a great blessing to have the, po the power to do the impossible, isn't it? It's a great blessing to be able to do, have the power to do the impossible. He gives us the power to do what he calls us to do. How about a blessing? The second tremendous best blessing is to live for God before live before God without fear. In virtually every religion of the world today, it, it adherence lives it, it, the it, it, it adherence live in fear that they will never be good enough or accepted to, for their deity. You know that people just they fear that they'll never be good enough to live and to serve their deity, the ones that they worship. Guess what? 
Guess what? He pours down blessings on us. He pours down blessings on us. We don't have to fear, do we? We don't have to fear the Lord. We have to fear serving Him anyways. Christians don't have to fear because Jesus already took our punishment and our atone for our sins. This is the Apostle John. He says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. That's 1 John 4, 18. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to live before God with, without fear? We don't have to live, to live before God in fear. We don't have to live in fear. We are graced with perfect peace to travel our etern- or to our eternal home. Thank God for the hope that we have in Christmas. That little baby born in a manger. That itty bitty baby born in a manger on that first Christmas day brought us hope. Brought us hope. 2,000 years ago, a baby lying in a manger. Flashback to 2019. The same baby is still bringing us hope, isn't he? That same baby is still bringing us hope. He's still bringing us peace. He's still bringing us joy. He's still bringing us love. Sure, he grew into a man. We all know that. We all know that he did that. But this time of year, we just think about that baby and the hope that we have in Christ. Let's wrap this up. Our great Savior says in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace... There will be no end. He will reign over David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, righteousness, from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The hope of Christmas.